Now tell your neighbor, don't neglect hiccups. Hiccups can be simple and hiccups can go away by deep inspiration so that you keep your diaphragm steady and the hiccup may go away. Then you can also drink a gulp of water. Have you tried drinking a gulp of water? And the hiccup goes away. But some hiccups don't go away because hiccups can be a symptom of a serious disease. So there was a gentleman who ignored his hiccups and many suffered because of that. And you may be already guessing the name of that gentleman. We have spoken about him in recent times with a reason. Uh, Luke chapter 17 verse 20. When he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said the kingdom of God does not come with observation. You know we are living in a very show world so that we must show everything we do and show it loud even more than it happened. And of course the SP helps us to exist. Show it up where we went, what we eat, how we laughed, we show it up. So we have become a world, we have become a society that is all for observation, isn't it? But Jesus says the kingdom of God does not come with observation, which means with, with audiovisual fantasy. It may, but that's not what we should look for. What do we look for then? Nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. So, there is this categorical statement by our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't go looking here and there for the kingdom. Be assured of the kingdom of God within you. This is our emphasis today. That we will be assured of the kingdom of God within us. Then he said to the disciples, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look here or look there, do not go after them or follow them. For, the, for as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day of coming again. So it is a sad thing that most who are born into Christian families know about the first advent. How many of you knew about the first advent from about your first year of life? Put your hand up. Okay, from about 18 months you knew about the first advent? I mean, you didn't recognize the Christmas tree. Yeah, you know? Okay, now okay, once again, here we go again. How many of you recognize Christmas? I mean, okay, 18 months or 24 months. Please put your hand up. I mean, hand up. Yeah. You recognize. I'm not saying agree with Christmas. All I'm saying is you knew Jesus Christ came the first time. I'm not asking you to agree how it should be celebrated, but he came. Okay? We all knew, isn't it? We all knew. But so many of those who knew about his first coming, first advent, do not know that Jesus Christ is coming a second time. Many of our relatives are like this, isn't it? Isn't it a sad thing? Leave alone others, you know. But those who are born into Christian families do not know Jesus Christ will come a second time. So my story today is so well, so well fits the scenario of His coming. We want to look at it line by line, okay? So now did you understand this scripture says the Son of Man, that is Jesus Christ, will come again? He was Son of God but He came from God. He is Son of Man because He took our form when He came. Give me a way if you understood that. Son of God but He came from God. Son of Man because He took our form when He came. So He is verily God and verily man. That's how Charles Wesley put it. That's, that's standard theology. Jesus Christ is God and Jesus Christ is man. You have witnesses who don't believe Jesus Christ is God. You know that, doesn't it? Seventh-day Adventist is also mitigated or violated. But we just want to get on to this story that so illustrates principles of his coming. And first he must suffer many things, so he did. 
and that coming would be verse 26 of Luke 17 as it was in the days of Noah so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man coming again now in Noah's day which was about 2350 BC they ate, they drank, they married wives the problem was they, they had sexual cohabitation in so many they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all Eight were saved. Noah saved his family. Shall we give a hand clap to Jesus? Then Noah saved himself and saved his family. 2350 BC. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank. Then something more is added. They bought, they sold, they planted, and they built. So by the time it came to Lot, the world had progressed in the worldly sense. And there was market, there was buying and selling. Did you know the difference between Noah's time and Lot's time? Noah's time only had the sexual cohabitation and eating and drinking. By the time it came to Lot's time in 1950 BC, it was quite a metropolis. Will you say the metropolis? There was buying and selling. So you understand the historical context and you will understand these are true Bible stories and the Lord Jesus recounts it as it happened. So, coming of the Lord would be like also the time of Lot. On that day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Now you can't ignore this analogy because it says fire and brimstone from heaven destroy them all. Even so it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Okay, so we know that sodomy takes the name from Sodom and it is, it is peculiar that in our time this terrible, horrible sin has become global and it has become well accepted and so many religions, so many uh, nauseating things are being reported uh, because of this problem. Even in Sri Lanka, they have now legislated that anyone wanting a transient operation that should be done in a Sri Lankan government hospital at government expense. So it has come this far. Now we want to look at the exact time that this book describes about. But we are going to Genesis chapter 18. Two different scenarios. Same time. Say with me, same time. Two different scenarios. Genesis 18. We want to do a comparison. Then the Lord appeared to him by the terrific tree of memory as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. Who is this? Abraham. Now you would find that L-O-R-D is capital L-O-R-D. Therefore it's Yahweh appeared to him by the terrific tree of memory and he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. Now keeping your finger right. 18, we go to 19, which is just after 18. We will turn to 19. Now you must bring the proper Bible, which is the printed Bible. You must meditate from this Bible. Looking at the electronic Bible, you will not remember. That's fact. If you want to remember your scriptures, if you want to meditate, if you want to write the scriptures in your heart, we, you have to read a printed Bible. Okay? Chapter 19. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and he bowed himself with his face to the ground. So Abraham was sitting in this old ramshackle tent at his door and Lot, you will see me, and Lot now say to the word of whom and Lot was sitting at the gate of Sodom. What a beautiful existence Abraham was having and what a pompous existence Lot was having. And they were uncle and nephew, now separated by some choices Lot made. Got the scenario? Got the scenario? Where are you sitting? Abraham was not poor. 
Abraham was a nation king, a tribal king. He had 380 trade men who would beat an army of five kings who came against Sodom. Abraham was so good. Just that his, he kept his call and he was <coughs> looking after his family and he was looking after those who were born in his tent and he was keeping the watch of the Lord at his tent door. Some time ago, Lord separated from his godly uncle and when he became an orphan, God put him under Abraham and Lord came under Abraham's blessing and covering and Lord prospered under Abraham's covenant. I will bless who are with you. I will bless those who bless you. But he made a fatal decision one day. And fatal decisions begin one day, one hour, one minute at a certain synchronicity. That decision came and he separated and by and by he began to pray at the door of Sodom. Now the time has come. Say with me the time. Abraham knew the time had come. Lot did not know the time had come. What time? Time for this promised child. Can you hear, can you hear my voice? <clears throat> I can't hear my voice. I'm screaming. Time had come for Abraham to receive the promised child. Now, the Lord came in a theophany and a triperson theophany. Three persons came, taking human form, to meet with Abraham. Okay. And then Abraham immediately recognized. Back to 18. I hope it's not confusing for you to get back to 18. He lifted his eyes and looked behold, three men were standing and said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass me by. That's a nice prayer. That's all he do not pass me by. And of course the Lord came to tell Abraham, Abraham, your time has come for you to have this son I promised. Son I promised. Time had come. And verse 10, the Lord said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door which was behind me. I will certainly return to you. You hear the scriptological overtones. Jesus said, my return, the day of the Son of Man. Here, the word of God, the Lord tells Abraham, I will return and I will give you your promise. So when we like Abraham, foster our men, nest, and nurture those who are in our tent, Sitting at the gate watching with the Lord. So let's say well. <clears throat> when I am at my tenth door, watching with the Lord, nurturing those in my tent, the Lord will visit me with His promise. Is that good enough? Is that glory enough? Is that what we live for? That's what we live for. And here is the other scenario. It's a fabulous scale. Sodom was the largest metropolis of its time. And they have fully excavated Sodom. It's at the southeastern border of the Red Sea. But, and true to archaeology, true to scripture, archaeology has proved. And when you excavate, you go through stratum after stratum. And you get, get the archaeological age from the point end and the pottery and stuff like that. And when you dig through, you come to the sodden stratum and it's now covered with all ash. But once upon a time, it also has mm, paleobotanical stuff. That is botanical archaeological stuff. It was a plush, flourishing orchard and vineyard. It was very green at the time Sodom went, Lot went there and it was very brown by the time Lot was coming out of it. We may be honest. We don't want that to happen to our city. Agreed. Agreed. So Abraham 
the three came to Abraham and the Lord remains with Abraham. Other two go away. Verse 22, Genesis 18, 22. Then the men turned away from there and went to a Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. Abraham is waiting before the Lord. Abraham's future is secure. Abraham was promised the son. Lord said, I'll come back to you. I will look after everything about you. And here is the Lord's prophecy. Lord is giving a prophecy of Abraham to himself. He's, the Lord is so encouraged. See Genesis 18, 19. Uh, since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, who said this? The Lord is prophesying about Abraham to himself. Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children. The Lord is thinking about Abraham's life. And the Lord is so pleased. The Lord, can you imagine the Lord of the universe who spawned the galaxies and the next galaxy and the next galaxy and the our entire galaxy, the Milky Way, and the one after that, and everything in the solar system. But he's thinking about his righteous follower, Abraham. What do you think God is most pleased thinking about? The sapphires, the blue sapphires, the diamond that sits on Queen Elizabeth's crown, that is giving some reprieve to our God fearing Prime Minister Theresa May. God is thinking about this ardent follower of God, Abraham. And God is speaking to himself encouragement because the Lord has some sad business in his heart. So the Lord also needs people to speak encouragement to him when he has some sad business in his heart. So he's encouraging himself about the godly progeny, about the God, godly remnant that was in Abraham's tent. I have known him order that he may command his children and his household after him. That's why the Lord came to us, that we will look after our house. Sodom is looking after all the important, Lot is looking after all the business affairs of the gate of Sodom, greatest metropolis. He's very busy there. He's the best known man there. And when the two persons come with lordly appearance, it's Lot who goes to meet him, not anybody else. Because the most important person at the gate of Sodom is who? God. But he didn't influence anything of Sodom with his godliness. Sadly, Sodom's ungodliness invaded Lot more than Lot's godliness invading Sodom. That's the sad part of Lot's life. Lot wasn't a pauper. Lot wasn't a laborer. Lot wasn't a peer. Now, all those are worthy vocations. Lot was the most important man. And when two important personages come who look as if they are bringing in million dollars of FDI, foreign direct investment, and Sodom was going to get a triple A rating by Fitch. So it was Lot who got up to meet them. But here, God is, the Lord is thinking about Abraham. Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great because their sin is very great. Then the men go away. Now they are under commission to go and do to Sodom what the Lord has decided. But the Lord is tarrying here, I shouldn't say with two minds. Uh, he is thinking inside himself do I share this with Abraham or not? Meanwhile, the two angels go to the gate of Sodom to do what they have been commissioned to do. Understand? They have already gone. But Abraham is before, before the Lord. Suppose, would you also destroy the righteous with the weaker? Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for 50 righteous? Who is speaking? Abraham is doing this conversation. He's pleading earnestly. His tent is secure. His city or his area is secure. Now he's pleading for the city in which his nephew Lord was. Good Christian, this is his part is secure. 
but he's in constant position where he had a sense those two angels went off in a hurry and in a flurry and they look more like cherubim than the seraphim. A seraphim sign, the presence of God, scattering the glory of God, and they interact with children, in children of God in glory. When God has some rumble with some city, cherubims carry a lightning, a chariot full of lightning, and when they start coming, there's trouble for the asking. Abraham recognized those two angels didn't look as if they were going on a mercy mission. Get the point. You remember last, Sunday before last. Sunday before last was what? May 28th. No, June 4th. The whole country had been lashed by winds and floods. And June 5th they said, the whole storm fall will come to blood. And the clouds were green, the sky looked green, all nations' mood was green. And they said 7.15 Monday, June 5th, the storm fall will hit Colombo. All the army was alerted and the navy boats, all the navy boats, wherever they could get it, were, were ready because the storm fall was going to hit Colombo. And all know that Colombo people don't have the patience, the grit, the all stations people have. And the government gets worried that anything is coming to Colombo. Anyway, that night, we remember, we prayed like this. We said, Lord, we have raised our voice to you. We have felt the lamentation of the country, the death and the destruction. And we said, in Jesus' name, this town fall will be driven out by East Wind. That's what I did. And that's what happened next morning. And the whole storm left Kalam. My suggestion was landing in the Indian Ocean and we used to be somewhere else. So we can call for the Lord. And Abraham is in earnest intercession. And he says 50. Then he says 5 is then 50. He comes down to 10. 31. Indeed now I have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose 10 should be found there. The Lord said, I will not destroy it for the sake of ten. So the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham and Abraham returned to his place. Now, Genesis chapter 19, Abraham had made the no, Abraham is in this intercession. Just, just, just take it, Abraham is in this intercession. On this side, the two angels are coming and the Lord looks at them, does not recognize their angels, he thinks they are very important persons and more important the person, you bow down, little important, little bow down, some more important, some more bow down. When they look very important, you bow down. So he bowed down with his, that's how the world goes, isn't it? And he bowed down because they were going to have a FDI many million dollars. Lord saw them, he rose to me, I'm at chapter 19. He said, now I want to get some points through to you. Stay blessed, ask before you leave. Do not leave legacy in haste. Can you get this slide? Do not, will you write this down? You can tell your children this, you can work at your workplace saying this. Do not leave legacy in haste. Are you writing it down? Do not leave legacy in haste. There comes inheritance, then there is heritage, and then there is legacy. Inheritance comes from the Lord and the parents. And in, 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 when, we, when we sustain the inheritance, and when we pass it on, it is heritage. When they receive it, it is legacy. Give me a way if you understood that. So when parents have increased, as our generation did, when we have increased more than our parents, we are working with heritage. And when we, when we hand it over, if our children are to sustain our increase, they have to work with the same Lord the way we have worked. Do you understand that? So inheritance, heritage, passed on, and when they receive it, what does it become? Legacy. Say the three generations. Not enough. Three generations. So teach your children 
to work with what you are handing on to them. Especially our generation that has received much more than our parents. And we want to hand them over to our children and they need to work it out, heritage to legacy. Then be careful about your choices. Now, this is what Lot did many years ago. He was with his godly uncle Abraham and there was a fight between the shepherds. Lot felt what I have in the blessing is not enough. I am departing, parting, separating. That's what Lot thought. Separation came into his heart. But he said, what I have with my godly uncle is not enough. Forgetting that what he had was because of his godly uncle. Did you understand? So he looked. He moved. Then he pitched his tent closer. And then we next find him right inside the gate of Sarah. By that time, he had become very important son, and he had increased. Few more things about that moment. So be careful about your mate, you can never change them. Be careful about the job you change, check whether you are going into, will enhance your faith or not. Check even the city you are moving into. Check the friends you are going to commune with. Now, Lot already knew there's something brown in soil, but the green looked better. When the green is greener than green should be, you need to be careful. Get what I mean? Why is it so green? There might be something. Why is it so green? Also look for the brown patches before you move. What you are blessed in, stay there. Quick success may have a quick fall. Quick success may have a quick fall. Discern brown in the green. You know, Bukshep, when he is taking the sheep to the next Shefela, Shefela is the Hebrew name for the pasture that is higher than the last one. He, with his expert eye, checks out the poisonous weeds, whether it has poisonous weeds in that. It may, if it looks greener than green, there's something more green than grass. That's not for consumption. Give me a way if you understood that. There's something more greener than green. Green is not grass. It's a poisonous weed and the shepherd says that looks very green, but it's not grass. I will not leave my sheep there. Every father should be like that. Every CEO should be like that. Every pastor should be like that. When something looks greener than grass, it's not grass, it's not poisonous. We do understand that. Then we take heart. We advise our children. We advise from school. We advise from our family. Family Bible reading time, isn't it? We advise in the cell. We advise in many ways. We keep watch over who we have charge over about whom we have been given account. Is he falling for something that looks green but not grass? It's a poisonous weed. The shepherds of Israel knew to discern the shepherd before he, they will take them to the next pasture. And they also discern what is brown in the green. Discern brown in the green. Discern if it's too green, it's not grass. Lot's lot. Can we have the slide? Lot's lot. Lot was weak in his emotions, worldly in his desires, wrong in his decisions, wrecked his destiny. And here is the definition of destiny. Takes from God's past up to now all that has happened, even before we came to know the Lord. What went on? God had a way of adjusting things, taking us through our past to bring us to what he has for us. You know, I grew up in a atheist home, completely atheist. But all that was very good for my training, for what I had to become. I learned Buddhist concepts. I grew up in a completely singular cultural home. I grew up in classical singular language. 
who knew to do all this? Only God knew that. Only God knew that. Same with you. This is not for one person. What is destiny? Destiny takes from God's past. Bad things have happened. Good things have happened. The God of all comfort comforted you through terrible things that you might be a comfort of others. 2 Corinthians 1, 3. God of all consolation. All bad things that the hard struggle you have to come to get where you are is meant for you to be a Barnabas to help others who are struggling. Give me a way. When you get where you are, don't forget others who are struggling in university without funds. Don't forget the hard times. I was in our home, funds are not easy. I never want to take old books to school. At the end of the work year, I always study and I want to have new books for my new year. I didn't know one year. My father couldn't afford new books. So there is an old bookshop called Dharmapala Bookshop on top of Visakhar. That was the place I bought books. One year, he bought me old books. And some of you may be there. But when we have come to some station in life, why have you gone through these difficulties? Without some and help them in their studies. I will see. That's the way God's past works for us. God takes, destiny takes from God's past. And we are living God's best today. Don't say best is yet to come. That best is never coming. Destiny is that you are living God's best today. If you are not feeling like that, you have dropped the destiny, dropped the battle, some trouble has come. Give me a way to understand. Every day, the Lord wants us to live as the best day ever. No blue days, no gloomy days. It will be better in the sweet by and by. Some prophecy will come. Now there's a common slogan. Promises shall never fail. On God's side. Every prophecy is a potential on our side. You can write it down. Every prophecy is a potential on our side. So destiny is God and me working together. Destiny is God and me working together. So destiny takes from God's past, living God's best today, looking for God's more tomorrow. Looking for God's more tomorrow. Certainly we know. Our children must be inculcated to look for more. Certainly we know. We must put these habits, good habits of hard work, work ethic, prayer, study, read the word, good friends. And they must know every day they can be yoked only equally to a believer like them. Never unequally yoked to unbelievers. Put this in your children's heart. Dhuriya, where there is an inheritance that you have made into a heritage because of your godly living and you have a legacy to give. But legacies have to be received in the same intensity of faith. You understand my doing this. Legacy has to be received, same in a spiritual house, same in a home. Legacies have to be received in the same intensity of faith, parents received it. So, let's pray a little. Rest is very psychological. I want to read this message as great encouragement to you. Abraham's intercession. God's prophecy for Abraham. And the Lord said, I'm returning to give you my promise. Jesus is returning. We must get ready for it. It's a day of redemption for those who are looking for that day. It's a day of retribution for those who have turned away. So our responsibility to pray and work and get up parents our relatives, our cousins, our friends to understand there is a day of asking about what God has given to our lives. There is a day we will have to give an account. Jesus said he is coming.
Let's first secure our children's future. That we have received an inheritance. Let's thank God as well. Let's thank what came to us from our parents. Maybe you received the land. Maybe you received the house. We all received the education from our parents. How thankful we can be. Now say, will you please say, Lord Jesus, I'm making a heritage. This is what destiny is. To hand over. Lord, I pray. Will you stretch your hands in front of me? Lord, I pray. As I stretch my hands in front of me, I'm seeing my children. Even my grandchildren stretching their hands out in eagerness, in gratitude, in godliness to receive their legacy. Now we are going to breathe a breath of uh, uh, life giving breath in them, okay? We are going to do it together. One, two, three. Thank you. Lord, we believe. We have breathed. A heritage which our children and our grandchildren receive in the spirit because we breathe the breath of God into their spirit young as they are this breath of God will create in their heart deep devotion legacy intact legacy my God will I shall fall for me in blessed places. Thank you. I will be not exegetically true if I don't continue with the rest of the story, but quickly. This is a good point to remember, high point to take hold. But we have to look at the fallout. In faithfulness to the story, we have to look at the fallout. So I hope the fallout will only encourage us more to work out the inheritance heritage and to give a birth legacy. And you are visualizing young as they are, our children are receiving, isn't it? It's possible in the spirit. It gets written in the spirit. Beyond their studies, beyond what they have to do, they must study there, but in, the, in our spirit, in the house of God, we have communicated into their spirit something that is intelligently written. Did you understand that? You can do it in the spirit and it will be safe in their deposit. So this is a bit of a light of gear up for Father's Day, isn't it? it? It came today, so I had to do it today. I couldn't keep it till Father's Day, you know, when it comes in the spirit. But God will give us something more next next Sunday. So be in readiness. But we are now going to the follow. The follow is not nice at all, but we have to faithfully read it. So here we are. Lot at Sodom's gate and verse 4. Now, before they laid out, now, they, now what happened with this? Angels were, uh, Abraham is going on in the sea. Okay, you got it. You want Abraham here? You can picture it. You want, they want Abraham. Please come. They go to something the other day also. You know Abraham pleading with the Lord. For whom are you pleading? But ten righteous people. In, in this place, do you know the lot? <laughs> That's right. That looks like. And you are, now you have said, come. For into the investment has come. You are top of the world. No such people, no, no such lordly people have ever come to sort of escape. Smile that. Imagine how comes. That's right. That's right. And you have received them, you are negotiating with them, come home. And they are saying, no way. You remember what did the angels say? We are not coming to your home. We are on an assignment. We are on a commission. We are going to stay on the streets. Because they know they, what did the Lord send them for? Destroy Sodom. What is Abraham doing? Abraham in the Abrahamic face. He's reading. And Abraham said, 10 people. Why did Abraham stop at 10? You will see later, angels said, 
get your daughters saved. He said, I have two daughters not touched by men. You remember? Two. And there were other two who were married because there were two sons in law. Four. Then two sons in law, six. Then the angel said, Tell the sons that is seven. Two sons. Wife, nine. Lord, ten. God there is many. Precise. Abraham stopped at ten. Abraham knew Sodom is in terrible state. In between there was the episode, Lord God of Doctor. Five kings came and took him away. He should have died, he lost everything. Abraham comes and recovers everything. Lord should have got his lesson at that time, saying, By Sodom, no man I am going back to safety. Canaan where the promises. Did he say that? Did he say that? No, he didn't say that. He said, now my uncle paid the cost. I am going to be at the Sodom's gate. Hiccups. Say with me, hiccups. He didn't take hiccups seriously. Because Abraham risked his life. He took it for nothing. How many times we have seen this? People are saved because someone else risked the life. But they didn't, he didn't get the message. Stayed at the same gate of Sodom. Now Doomsday has come. He thinks business as usual. He thinks there's going to be a tomorrow. There's not going to be a tomorrow. He's saying to the angels, you can go on your way happily. There was not going to be another day for Lot and for Sodom. This was the last day of Sodom. How many of you have seen the film Last Days of Pompeii? You must be about 63. It came when you were very young. Isn't it? Last day of Pompeii. Ten, ten little one. Uh, so this was the last day of Sodom. And angels knew it. But Abraham is interceding. Abraham is interceding. Ten, Lord, ten. Now Lord knows there is no ten. But he has to allow Abraham's cry to take effect. Though the Lord is suffering. He is moved by the king. So the angels who were saying, we are not coming in. Verse 3 it says, okay we will come in. And they said, no, we will spend the night in the open sky. But he insisted strongly. So they turned into him and entered the house. So the angels came into Lot's house. Not because Lot was impressing, but God. Abraham was impressing before God. Before whom are you impressing? Give me a wave if you understand. God always heard him. So the two angels came in and got ready for the night. Here is the night. Now before they lay down, verse 4, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, and all the people from every quarter surrounded the house. And see their request. You know their request. They are asking to Sodom of money. Pray these two men who came here. They are thinking. They are men. They don't know their angels. Why request? Sad thing is, fathers and sons both come to, come to the door. Usually, fathers sin without sons to sin. Sons sin without fathers to sin. But when you see a father and a son sinning together, that's terrible degradation. God says, enough is enough. So if you have any situation, if you know someone, your father and son are sinning together, offer that matter. Mother and father, he, Go on your knees and say, please don't do this. But that has reached a limit in God's understanding. When fathers and sons start sinning together, whatever kind of sin, okay? Give me a way if you understood the gravity of fathers and sons sinning together. And that's what was happening. And that night had come. So they were negotiating. Lord was utterly compromised. And then uh, he's offering his daughters, verse 9, they said, step back, get out of our way. But, but the angels, were ten, say with me, the angels reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with them and shut the door. Say with me, shut the door. Before that, Lot shut the door. Say with me, too late, too little. Only two daughters were inside. Two daughters were outside. 
two sons were outside, two sons in the law were outside, his wife was inside, but her heart was in sort of you will presently see. This is that night. Not a pleasant thing, but to be faithful to the world we must read through. And they struck the men so that once the door is shut, what happens? They struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they became weary trying to find the door. So before the door is shut, we must tell our friends and neighbors and everybody else, please come to Christ. World's darkness is increasing. Our light is increasing for our sake. Remember, time is coming. Our light is increasing for our sake. Because the outside darkness is so great, it will try to swallow us. So we firstly light up the lamp, keep the oil burning for our sake. Say with me, our sake. Please don't misgauge the power of darkness. Already plagues are coming. Dengue T2 is worse than Dengue 1. It's a terrible thing. It's a mutation that changes the viral DNA RNA. Right. Whatever that for is. And next time around, it can be, I'm not preaching doomsday, I'm just telling science is that next mutation can make dengue 2, dengue 3 worse than dengue 2. Now dengue 1 kills on the second day. Whereas dengue 1, dengue 2 kills on the second day, dengue 1, for four days you had at least some time to get to hospital. Get the point? So we are living in a time that, that before our eyes, we can see darknesses. Increased. We don't know which way U.S. University. Whether President Trump is safe in his own White House, we don't. We haven't had seasons like this ever before. But the instruction for us is just don't let your light down, even for one hour. Keep it bright and burning and the flame alive. You say the flame alive. Flame alive. You are wondering why he is standing. Because Abraham stopped his intercession. Read the story. Only after Sodom was burned and Lord was saved. Through the night Abraham is interceding. I'll just fast track it. Luke, uh, Genesis 19. Genesis 19. Genesis 19, 29, and it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overflow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. Abraham kept watch. That's where he was standing on. Till Lot was saved. Lot is still not saved. He has been pulled up into the house. They shut the door and send him back again. Angels send him back again saying, uh, verse 12, Then the men said to Lord, Have you anyone else here? Sons in the do you have any sons? Okay. Uh, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place. Or we will destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons in law, who had married his daughters and said, Get up, get up. So Lot's message changed. Up to now, he was preaching the felt need gospel. If you have a felt need and you want my daughters, I'll give you terrible. But now he says, Get up, get up, for the Lord will destroy this city. But his sons in law, he seemed to be joking. You are not Lot, you are not Chiranta, your name is joking, said the sons in law. Okay. This is a temple night. So he said, Arise, take your wife, flee. Then he lingered. 16, he lingered, men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and brought them out of the city. He just abducted them out of the city. When they had brought them outside, escape for your life. Do not look behind. Verse 17. Not stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. Then Lord said to them, wait, wait, wait. not so fast, not so far. What did Lord say? Not so fast, not so far. What was the result? His wife perished. He just went a little bit. Not so fast, not so far. Abraham is in the city. 
You know the story, find love for sin. That's all that was said. Thank you. Let's wish it didn't come. But we want to keep the hope. We will say we want to keep the hope. That the inheritance we receive, whatever that has come our way after we were born again, it is the inheritance of the Lord. It may have never come unless we came under this Abrahamic covenant. It may have never come unless we said, under the blood of Jesus. Shall we rise to our feet? Let's thank God for the inheritance that has come our way since we were born again under the blood. Also, let's thank our parents and their memory who gave us what they could before we came under the blood. But make the distinction quite clear. What came to you after you came under the blood can be sustained, maintained or increased only under the blood. So let's take this confession together. Lord Jesus Christ, all together, Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you for what my parents gave me. But tonight I want to make a distinction. I thank you what came to me after I came under the blood. Thank you Lord Jesus. After I came under the blood, my marriage came under the blood. Lord Jesus, after I came under the blood, every child birth came under the blood. Lord Jesus, after I came under the blood, my health came under the blood. Lord Jesus, after I came under the blood, my finances came under the blood. Lord Jesus Christ, after I came under the blood, every weapon that is formed against me came under the blood. And fiery darts fell flat under the blood of Jesus. Now you must exercise the anointing for your sake. This is impartation. So the intensity you receive in this impartation, you take home, apply it over your children, apply it over your children's future years, apply it over it to your children's partners who are due to come. Will you say hallelujah? Amen.